If you're into trains and you live in the United States, there are a few infamous stories that repeatedly come up in rail fan lore. The Crazy Eights incident, the Penn Central bankruptcy, and the complete failure of the EMD SD50 class of locomotive. Today we're going to learn about one of the most unreliable North American locomotives of all time and how the railroads that owned them tried to fix their issues. The 1970s were an interesting time for American railroads. The early 70s were a time when railroads wanted the most powerful locomotives possible, such as the EMD DDA-40X, a 6600 horsepower monster built for Union Pacific that was powered by two EMD 645E3 turbocharged V16s. That's right, the DDA-40X had 32 cylinders and a displacement of 338 liters, which is the same as 169 Honda Civics. Unfortunately, much like the muscle car era of the late 60s, it all came to an end in 1973 when the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries placed an embargo on oil. This caused the price of oil to rise drastically. The effects could be seen in almost all industries that use vehicles. People stopped buying gas-guzzling American cars in favor of more efficient Japanese cars, and railroads sidelined their massive locomotives and searched for more efficient ones. North America's two biggest locomotive manufacturers, General Motors Electromotive Diesel Division and General Electric, scrambled to create locomotives that had the same amount of hauling power while at the same time getting better fuel mileage. In 1976, General Electric came out with their Dash 7 series, including the C30-7 and later the C36-7. The Dash 7s proved to be reliable workhorses, making between 3,000 and 3,750 horsepower out of turbocharged V12s and V16s. At the same time, EMD expected that their SD40-2s introduced in 1972 would continue to sell, but despite the fact that they were extremely reliable, they were less efficient and had less hauling power than the competition, and many railroads didn't like to use them on heavy freight trains for this reason. EMD continued to expect to sell locomotives, beginning to push their new SD45 locomotive, which was more powerful than the SD40s, but what they failed to realize was that although the SD45s were powerful, they used massive V20 engines that made them get really bad fuel mileage. Finally, after a few years of not knowing why their SD40s and SD45s weren't selling, EMD finally realized what they had to do, almost 10 years after the beginning of the oil crisis. In December of 1980, EMD introduced a brand new locomotive called the SD50. This new type of locomotive looked pretty similar to the SD40 and it used a similar 645 turbocharged V16, but this time it revved to 950 RPM as opposed to 900 to make 3500 horsepower while being about as efficient as the competition. Additionally, EMD offered large discounts to railroads that ordered SD50s in bulk. A total of 492 locomotives were ordered new by 12 railroads, including some heavy hitters such as Conrail ordering 135, Canadian National ordering 60, and the Seaboard System ordering 81. Some unique variations of these locomotives include six SD50S locomotives delivered to Norfolk and Western, which were regular SD50s with shorter frames. I'll talk more about this later. Another oddity was a bunch of engines ordered by Canadian National, which were classified as SD50. FDFs. These SD50Fs were also internally identical to the SD50s, but they used a cowl with body and a funky looking cap. Additionally, in 1984, all SD50s were upgraded from 3500 horsepower to 3600. Soon enough, EMD began receiving countless complaints from railroads that had purchased these new locomotives, stating that they were failing constantly for various reasons. Some of these issues had to do with the new complicated computer systems failing, which was totally fixable, but many shops didn't know how to do so. Unfortunately, a few of these complaints were issues that were much more expensive to fix. Power assemblies, crankshafts, and entire engine blocks would constantly fail, leading to extremely laborious and expensive repairs. The cause for this issue was a mix of rush development creating the computer software and overstressing the motor to make as much power as possible. This was because the 645 V16, which was intended for use at lower RPMs, was fitted to run at 950 RPM in order to squeeze as much power out of it as possible in order to be competitive with GE. The extra stress from having to move faster in addition to the extra boost pulled in by the turbocharger would cause these locomotives to blow up pretty early on as opposed to the earlier ST40s which were infamously reliable, still being seen in regular freight service to this day. Unfortunately at this point there wasn't much else EMD could do other than to deliver the remaining ST50 orders and get to developing a new locomotive to replace the ST50. In 1984 EMD released the ST60 which was built to be a successor to the ST50. This new ST60 model looked nearly identical to the ST50 but on the inside it was completely different. The ST60 utilized a brand new EMD 710 V6 capable of producing 3800 horsepower at a lower 900 RPM. 
Additionally, it was 3% more fuel efficient than the ST50, and it got rid of many of the software-related issues that plagued the ST50. By all regards, the ST60 was an entirely superior locomotive to the ST50, making more power out of a more modern, reliable, and efficient motor. The ST60 officially replaced the ST50 in EMD's locomotive lineup in 1984, and ST50 production came to a close, finally ending in 1987. Unfortunately, despite the fact that the SD60 was a very good locomotive, the rushed SD50 had greatly damaged EMD's reputation as a trustworthy locomotive manufacturer, allowing GE to take the spotlight. This was made much worse when General Electric released their first new Dash 8 locomotive in 1983, right before EMD's SD60. The SD60 had stronger sales figures than the outgoing SD50, but it certainly wasn't as successful as the Dash 8. As SD60 slowly sold, the railroads that owned SD50s worked hard to find some sort of way to fix their issues. Many found that if they made some minor modifications to the locomotive governor, they could get the SD50s to run at 900 RPM as opposed to 950, which would cut down greatly on the high RPM related issues. These new lower revving SD50s were derated to 3000 horsepower and renamed to SD50-2s. Many of these still run to this day as they're basically just larger SD40-2s now. Norfolk Southern did a similar thing, rebuilding their SD50s and SD50Ss into SD40Es, which now revved to 900 RPM and had more modern EM2000 microprocessors, which cut down on the software issues. Anyways, enough about the SD50s and SD60s, how did the PR43Cs relate to any of this? Well in 2008, back in the days when Norfolk Southern was an innovative railroad, they wanted to see what they could do to build an EPA Tier 2 emission standard compliant locomotive using innovative genset motors in conjunction with the traditional diesel engine. Instead of doing this project in-house, NS teamed up with Progress Rail, a relative newcomer to the rail industry. This new locomotive manufacturer was owned by Caterpillar, which was experienced in building diesel engines for construction. Progress Rail laid out a plan to rebuild previously unreliable NS SD50 locomotives into newer locomotives. They planned to do this by ripping out the previously troublesome EMD 645 prime mover, placing it with the Caterpillar C175 turbocharged V12. In addition to the 3600 horsepower V12, the locomotives would be boosted by a smaller 700 horsepower C18 genset motor. Back then, genset was considered to be the future for locomotives, as it was supposedly more efficient. Genset locomotives worked differently than regular diesel engines, because they were comprised of many smaller motors that would shut down when not needed, making for a more efficient locomotive. Usually on locomotives that only used gensets, they would suffer from less low-end torque, which is extremely important for hauling heavy trains. But when used in conjunction with the traditional prime mover, gensets would provide an extra boost at high RPMs. As I mentioned earlier, these locomotives would be more efficient thanks to the genset while also having extra radiators and equipment for fewer emissions. By 2010, Progress Rail had produced two of these locomotives, one of which was rebuilt from Union Pacific SD50 No. 9881, and one of which was rebuilt from NS SD50 No. 6509. These two locomotives kept the same EMD standard cab design while having a modified long hood with emissions management technology. These two locomotives, numbered 4000 and 4001, began testing mostly in the American South, while Progress Rail completed yet another locomotive, being rebuilt from NSSD50 number 6525. This locomotive was numbered 4300 and it never went to Norfolk Southern, rather serving as a demonstrator unit for other railroads to try out. These new locomotives were called PR43Cs, with the PR standing for Progress Rail, the 43 representing the 4300 total horsepower, and the C representing the C-C or 6 axle wheel arrangement. This program got rid of two NSSD50s which added to the 58 total that were rebuilt to SD40Es in 2008. Of course, this was welcomed by the railroad, who at this point was sick of the SD50s and their problems. Initially, the PR43s actually worked quite well for NS, and soon enough they ordered some more. Beginning in 2011, NS took delivery of 10 more PR43Cs, which this time around were rebuilt from SD60s. Despite that, they were mechanically identical to the SD50-based PR43s. The only differences were cosmetic, with the newer SD60-derived PR43s having unique Progress Rail wide caps. This second batch of locomotives was numbered 4002 through 4011. The new PR43s entered service down south with their SD50-based counterparts. At the same time, NS was experimenting with other ways to modernize their SD60s, and they eventually decided that rebuilding them to SD60Es would be a better way to go than to have Progress Rail do it. At that point, the PR43C program was considered to be dead by many, but the 12 locomotives continued to serve on NS, now beginning to have some issues with their genset motors. After repeated failures, the PR43s unfortunately found themselves in storage in Chattanooga, Tennessee. By 2015, the PR43s were sitting in Chattanooga with an uncertain future ahead of them, but in that same year, they were renumbered from 4011 to 130 through 141 in order to make room for the AC44 C6Ms that would be numbered in the 4000s. Many rail fans speculated that the PR43s would re-enter service after that 
because why would NS go through the trouble of renumbering them if they would never operate again? Unfortunately, these theories proved to be wrong when all 12 PR-43s were returned to Progress Rail's Mayfield, Kentucky shops in late 2017. By 2018, they were chopped up into parts. Nowadays, all PR-43Cs are assumed scrapped, including the Demonstrator 4300. So why are the PR-43s important? Well, most obviously, they did something with a few of Norfolk Southern's SD-50s to make them slightly more useful. At the beginning of the video, the SD-50s were overly complicated and unreliable, and by the end of the video, they were turned into undoubtedly reliable SD-40Es and, well, interesting PR-43Cs. Also, they're important because they're a big part of Norfolk Southern's experimental era, which was pretty cool. Finally, what I would consider to be the most influential part of these locomotives was how they showed the railroad that genset technology is unreliable, and since the PR-43Cs, Norfolk Southern hasn't experimented with genset technology that much. Well, anyways, that wraps up today's video. Let me know in the comments if you want me to do more rebuild videos, and if so, what locomotives should I do? With that said, there's a bunch more content like this on the way, so stay tuned and thanks for watching.